talk about church blueprints as we think about kind of where we are being the church and it looks like we're going to be occupying a church facility. We won't be using rented space as we have for the last 17 years. And, um, and so we're going to take some time to walk through Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. It's the letter where he really lays out God's blueprints for the church and how the church is con should configure itself in order to be what God would want it to be. And when he, you would expect, and it's not going to be any surprise to you, when we read about God's blueprints for the church, we don't read about bricks and mortar because God's building materials are people. That's what it says in your worship folder, the text right beneath the title, it says, and in, in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And the way we understand how God shows up on the earth, it began with the tabernacle in the wilderness and it was a portable structure in which the Holy of Holies was built, and that was where God manifested his presence. Uh, you remember Raiders of the Lost Ark? And if you come across the Lost Ark, boy, the, the, you don't want to open that thing up. <laughs> you know what happens? Those, those things come in, your face melts, and you know what would happen really, though? If we, um, if we did discover the Ark, again, they haven't, we haven't, we lost track of it when the nation of Judah went into captivity in 586 B.C. Don't know where it is. Maybe Ethiopia, we don't know. If somebody were to find it, pry off the lid, there wouldn't be anything come out of it. There'd be some sand, there'd be remnants of tablets of stones. Because you know, here's the deal between you and I. Ready for this? God doesn't live there anymore. You say, where does he live? He lives in the midst of individuals who call him Lord, who seek to follow him. That's what it says, isn't it? And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. That's what the church is all about. It's, this is how God constructs a place where he manifests his presence. And what we'll find, these blueprints contain descriptions of relationships that will cause a community of his followers to be a temple in which he lives. And what we find right from the beginning is a priority that will strike us as being understandable, but we'll look at it, and it's fairly striking. It will tell us to protect unity. Look what it says. In Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 15, we begin with, an understanding of his mission. Again, what it's going to tell us in the text in Ephesians 4 is to make every effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit. That's the way it begins. And because we are being built into a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit, what do we do with that? And what it says is this. Make every effort. There is not a stronger command in the Bible. Literally what it means, it's make haste, speed, speed. And so if you want to do something, we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we do church? This is what will be priority one. Make every effort to preserve, keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so we have to understand what that means. But first, let's look at God's mission. God's mission. Ephesians 2 verse 11 says, Therefore, remember that at that time, prior to Christ coming, and it's looking at the time prior to Jesus coming to the earth, and it's going to describe the opportunity for we who are Gentiles. Again, the world to a Jew was divided up into two people groups. There were Jews, and then there was everyone else. And everyone else were called Gentiles. And so from a Jewish frame of reference, there's two groups of people in the earth. There's Jews and non-Jews who are called Gentiles. And so Paul's describing prior to Christ how much opportunity there was for Gentiles to be included in God's family. Look what it says. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, 
by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. I think it says God's mission was to do several things. First of all, tear down the walls. Tear down the walls. Look what it says. It says, for he himself is our peace who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. God's purpose, there's a division that exists between Jews and Gentiles. And what God's mission was, as it says here, to tear down the dividing wall of hostility, to bring down the wall, to tear down the wall that exists between those who are included as God's people and those who aren't. It's a shocking revelation in light of Old Testament law. If you read the Bible, it seems to mandate, I'm, I'm using my words very carefully here, the Old Testament seems to mandate discrimination. It seems to mandate segregation. If you're a Jew, there's the opportunity to be involved in God's purposes. If you're not a Jew, there, let, I'm going to read a verse. This is in the book of Deuteronomy, where Moses is laying out the law, and this is what it says. When the Lord your God drives you, brings you into the land you are entering to possess, and drives out before you many nations, here's the Gentile nations, Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations larger and stronger than you, and when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, and the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in the fire, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. And the you in that sense were Jews. And non-Jews weren't given much of a chance. You know what I did last night? Just for the heck of it, I Googled. Say Google. Old Testament discrimination. What am I going to come up with? The websites I found said absolutely not. Discrimination isn't taught. God is a God of justice. God is a God of justice, but the Old Testament does teach discrimination. Uh, and this is what Paul seems to say. Now again, what we're going to find, is this really what God wants? You're in and you're out, and we're going to see the cross tells us no, but what, let's face the fact that in the Old Testament, that existed. Can we do that? And again, we're not impugning God. We're not going to end up dissing him. We're just telling the truth. In the Old Testament, there is discrimination there. It seems to mandate it. And Paul would agree with this. Here's what he says. Look at the verse. Um, it says, therefore remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. And here's what we're trying to do. So here's what I want us to, if you're a Gentile, prior to the time that Jesus comes, you are without hope and without God in the world. Why? Because you're bad people? No, because you're not Jews. What are we going to do with that? Well, we just face it to begin with. And you know what Jesus came to do? There's a huge wall between Jews and Gentiles in the Old Testament. It's huge. You can't get over it. You know what Jesus came to do? Tear it down. That's what he came to do. To knock it down so that there's no discrimination between racial insiders and racial outsiders. You know what Jesus came to do? Get rid of racial sacred segregation. That's what he came to do. We don't always hear that, but that's what we learn about his purpose here. God removed distinction based on race. His purpose was to mandate desegregation. He tore down the walls that separated Jew from Gentile. It says he destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. There's a barrier that's described as the reason for hostility between Jews and Gentiles. And it says he destroyed it. Literally what it means, he tore it. And here's the deal. The, the word used to describe the dividing wall is a word used by 
people at that time specifically to describe the five to six inch veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. And that's what it's describing, that Jesus came and his purpose was to remove the barrier that creates hostility by tearing the veil that separates God from... You know what happened when Jesus died? Here's, I'll read, read to you. Um, it was now about the sixth hour and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Here's what happened. If we had been inside the temple in Jerusalem, you know how the temple in Jerusalem works? Um, been to the forbidden city in China, and there are courtyards within courtyards within courtyards within courtyards within courtyards. Every courtyard is more and more restrictive. So if you're walking into the temple in Jerusalem, Gentiles can be in the outermost courtyard. Then Jews can go into the innermost courtyard. Here's where women have to stop. Women can't go past this. Jewish men go into the inner courtyard from that. It becomes more and more and more restrictive until finally, here's God's presence, the Holy of Holies. There's a veil separating. There's one guy that can go into that place where God lives once a year. He's the high priest. And that's what the, is, that's kind of what it, it looks like. And you know what happens? Here's what Jesus did. When Jesus died, this barrier between the place where God dwells and the place where priests go, if you'd been there when Jesus died, this thing is, I think, five to six inches thick. That's a thick veil. It tore from top to bottom. And you know what Jesus was doing? God, the Father, was doing. It's an object lesson. And you know what the object lesson is? The barrier is gone. Not just the barrier between God and us, the barrier between Jew and Gentile. We are all one, and we come to God now that same way. That's what, that's what we're supposed to take from there. We tear down the wall, and tear up the laws. It's an equally shocking revelation. Look what it says. I'm going to read this. He himself is our peace, in verse 14, who has made the two one, destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by, and here's how he did it, abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. Here's what it seems to say. The reason why discrimination occurred in the Old Testament is because Old Testament law called for it. And what God did, if this is Old Testament law, this mandates segregation. What Jesus did, he tore down the walls and tore up the laws upon which sacred segregation was based. God tore up the laws in order to tear down the walls. He overturned Old Testament law in order to destroy the basis for sacred discrimination. This is what Christ accomplished on the cross. The cross destroys divisions. And what you find in the New Testament now? Discrimination based on race, sex, and gender is not part of the New Testament. You don't have to be a Jew. You can be a Gentile. You don't have to be a man. You can be a woman. You don't have to be a leader. You can be a slave. There is no discrimination now relative to coming to God's presence based on race, class, or gender. Here's what it says. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What does this mean? You say, okay, Mike. Okay, that's an interesting history lesson. Okay, I understand. That's what the cross does. Maybe I didn't understand that clearly before. I didn't know that Jesus came to tear down the wall that separates insiders from outsiders, and he tore up the laws. So it's not that we don't have to keep the commandments. Is that the commandments tell us that some are in, some are out, and, and God removed that. So what's our part? His mandate is for us 
Now let's read Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. God's mission is to promote unity, and that's why our mandate is to preserve unity. You know what it means? Literally, guard unity. What are we supposed to do? Job one, strange. Guard unity. That's what we're supposed to do. What's the first thing? Top thing, number one thing. Guard unity. If we were to chart the development of the church, let's start with the early church. And it's trace the development of the church along the ages, middle ages to today. What caption would you put below that description of the progress of the church? I'll tell you one thing we wouldn't put, unity. <laughs> Why? I don't think it's, I think we know that we're supposed to. I think we know that the Bible encourages gentleness, and I think they've known it throughout the ages. Why is, use, why is unity such a problem for the church? Why is there so much division? Again, I'm not going to lob grenades at them and say that we're much better. I'm not. Why is it so difficult for us? There's no shortage, I was kidding Joel, there's no shortage of they'll know we are Christians by our love songs. I mean, we know that we're supposed to be gentle. We know that we're supposed to be forgiving. We know that we're supposed to be accepting. But if we trace the history of the church, we haven't done a really good job at preserving the unity of the Spirit. And I guess I'm asking why. Maybe we don't know that the Bible encourages gentleness. Some of us, our mentors, we're not very gentle. We don't associate gentleness with Christianity very often. It feels like to be a Christian, you have to be... That's Christianity. Gentleness isn't often the picture, but that's what it says. It says, um, read, read it again, be completely humble and gentle. You know how we build a building in which God lives by his spirit? Through humility and gentleness. Huh. And again, we're going to look at why, but that's interesting. How can we be the church when we move into this? We're the church already. Being completely humble and gentle, being patient, bearing with one another. You know what that means? Putting up with one another. It doesn't mean that we agree with one another is that we give one another the right to believe a little bit differently about some non-major things. You know, it seems, it says I think we're supposed to do is major on the majors, don't major on the minors. That seems to be one of the issues that happens. When we major on minors, then we divide based on, oh, you don't believe that this is going to happen in the end? Oh, geez, well, if you don't believe that, and we tend to make minor things into major things and divide on that basis, but we're not supposed to do that. It's, it's, again, it says we're supposed to make every effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Um, C.S. Lewis observed this. He says, if he, as he looks at the church, he, he, he uncovered the phenomena of the inner ring. The phenomena of the inner ring. And here's the phenomena that he, he started with. There's a group of people, and one group determines that they're going to be more sacred than everyone else. So they become the inner ring. And now there's two rings. Now this inner ring decides, well, this isn't holy enough, so they make another inner ring. Then there's a third inner ring. The phenomena of the inner ring is that there's more and more rings, more and more separations. From the beginning of the church, the phenomena of the inner ring, I think that works. Unity, I don't see that. We're to encourage gentleness, I don't, and, and we're to discourage 
judgment or divisions. Look what it says. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no one clean thing and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. He's saying this is a strange verse. You know what happened with this verse? Paul didn't encourage Christians to separate themselves from the world. He didn't. When he went to Corinth at a place like that, they said, is it okay for us to go to the marketplace? He said, yeah, it's fine to go to the marketplace. Should we just hang around Christian people? He says, no, don't just hang around with Christian people. Should we separate ourselves from people that, that aren't as holy as we are? Should we be an inner ring? Paul says, no, don't do that. When individuals came in after him, after Paul left to do church elsewhere, the individuals who came in said, they asked questions like this. What does righteousness have in common with wickedness? What fellowship can light have with darkness? You know why they're asking these questions? To try to get the people to be more separate. What agreement is there between good and dark? And if you want to be light, what are you going to have to do? Stay out of the dark. Where's the dark? Is the dark in here? No, the dark is out there. So what do you have to do to be a good Christian? Don't go out there. Separate from everyone who is less holy than we are. That's what they ask these questions. What fellowship can light have with darkness? You want to be light? What is that going to mean? You're going to have to remove yourself from darkness. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Are you believers? Are you believers? What business do you have hanging around with unbelievers? That's what they'd ask. And the people thought, oh, wow, I, I guess. He said, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? You want to be holy? You have to stay away from them. Stay away from them. And that's what these people came, that after Paul left, they came in and said. And you know what they said? Come out from them and be separate. You know what Paul is quoting this verse to do? The very opposite for which people quote it. You know what Paul is doing? He's throwing their words back at them. Here's Paul's point. He's speaking to these individuals that have heard all these questions from these religious leaders who say to be separate. And you know what Paul's point is? You see this guy over here who's telling you to separate yourself from them? Separate from him. This is the guy that you separate from. Don't separate yourselves from the world. You need to be out in the world. You need to rub shoulders. They're not the enemies. He is. The one who says, build big walls between you and them. This is the enemy. This is the person that you need to be wary of. This person is sacred. He'll tell you you're much better than them. Don't be with them. You know what the deal is? You know what Paul says? Separate from the separatists. You know what the deal is? We're not supposed to be isolated. How can we shine love if we stay to ourselves? The thing that we don't understand sometimes, though, I think we know how to encourage gentleness. I don't think we're good at discouraging judgment. You know what I think? I think if that person's up there, it's easy for us to say, gee, that sounds logical. And you know what Paul said? No. Now, he wasn't mean. He didn't treat this guy harshly. What he did say Excuse me, you're not telling the truth. Wait, wait, what do you mean I'm not telling the truth? These people are light. They need to stay out of darkness. They're called to be light. How can you be light if you stay cloistered? And, you know, Paul says, don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. Take it in, but then say, you know what? I'm not supposed to separate myself. I'm not supposed to be judgmental. He shoots back at them. I think this is where the church gets tripped up. I think we're pretty good at saying yes to unifying influences. You know what? 
We're not good at saying no to divisive influences if they sound religious. Would you agree with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? If somebody is being biblical, we're not good at saying no to people who are harsh and judgmental. We kind of, okay, and I, I don't think that's okay. Because if we end up following what that person says, we separate ourselves, become the, the inner ring. In Paul's mind, divisive influences were dangerous. What kind of people are dangerous? We identify immoral people as being dangerous. Greedy people as being dangerous. People who don't act in moral ways. Again, now it's, it's not okay to be immoral, but you know what Paul said? Look what he says. Warn a divisive person once in Titus 3.10. And then warn him a second time. Now, here's what this, here's this guy. What he says, warn him once. Then warn him a second time. I'm sorry, I don't agree, and I don't like what you're saying. Warn him once, warn him a second time. Now, again, this guy, he's being very holy. The only thing, he's, he's preaching division. And what Paul says, warn him once, warn him twice, and at that time, have nothing to do with him. Isn't that strange? Separate from separatists. Divide from the divisive. They'll keep you from moving out there, walking among those to whom Christ issues this invitation. Come. There's no walls now. Come. That's what he wants us to do. And the God who bids us come is not divisive. And he's not judgmental. Paul's harshest words were leveled at sacred separatists. Let me read the last part of that verse. If they have nothing to do with him, you may be sure that such a man is sinful and warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. You know people were dangerous to Paul? Sinful people with judgmental separatists. Hmm. Hmm. Paul's harshest words were leveled at sacred separatists. That's what he said. Do you not, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. You know how we usually hear this applied? Don't smoke. You know, because you're God's temple, and if you smoke, you destroy God's temple. Or overeating. Okay, yeah, we, there's a destroyer right there. <laughs> and you know what it's talking about? It's not... <laughs> oh, Gary, get back in here. <laughs> you know what it's talking about? You here is plural. It's not singular. You know what it's saying? You are God's temple. And if anyone destroys God's temple, how are they going to destroy God's temple? By dividing it. That's what the point of the passage is. Divisive influences destroy the unity of the body. Paul says if anyone does that, God is angry. Now perhaps he, God, will be lenient with those who smoke. The thing, that, the thing that is really, and I'm very serious here, we tend to harp on moral issues. In God's economy, listen to me. When God says preserve unity, he is dead serious. You know what that means sometimes to preserve unity? Listen to me you're going to make religious people angry. They're going to judge you as not being holy enough. You shouldn't be hanging around with people like that. Again, now there is some, you know, sometimes we've got to watch who we hang around with. We can get pulled in a direction. But what he's saying is relative to showing that you're good Christians, come away from them. Don't. Don't. And if you don't stay away, you know what some people are going to do? Don't you know that you're supposed to be light? What are you doing? And you know what you're supposed to, that's, this is what we've got to watch out for. And if you try to preserve unity, you're saying, well, when Paul says this stuff, and he's really, he's speaking very strongly, 
Is Paul committed to Christian unity when he's saying these things? He was, you know what? Paul was unwilling to appease the religious if it meant abandoning the unreligious. Paul was not willing to appease the religious if it meant abandoning the irreligious. Was he committed to unity? Was he committed to unity? You know why he was? Because God cares about, listen, them. He cares about them. It's not us versus them. God sees the whole. He's not discriminatory. He reaches out to all. You know who was like that? Jesus. Do you remember when Jesus blew up the temple? Do you know what happened when he tipped? Because remember the courtyard of the Gentiles? This is the place that the Gentiles were supposed to have space. And there was no space there. It was being occupied by tables the Jews used to purchase things to be able to go further into the temple. And the reason why these tables are set up inside the outside, inside the inside of the courtyard, because this is the outside, God said, put up tables here. You know, buy your sacrificial stuff. Buy the lambs, buy the goats, buy the bulls, buy the pigeons. Have it outside. But this is the courtyard of the Gentiles. And I care about Gentiles, and this is for them. But re the reason the tables were not set up out there and they were put in here, because it's too far to walk. It's too far to walk. I don't want to have to walk and carry this goat from here all the way in here, so I'm going to set up in the courtyard of the Gentiles. And now I only have to carry the goat from here into here. And you know what Jesus did with this stuff? He took these tables and he threw them out of the way. Why? Because he cares about them. And this is their place. And it wasn't okay. You know what happened afterwards? I really would have liked to have seen this. So after Jesus did that, and I had a question. Did Jesus make anybody mad when he did that? Listen to me. Was Jesus being committed to unity when he did that? What's the answer? And Because here's what happened. There were people against the walls, the blind and the lame. And they were on the outside because there was no room on the inside. And so Jesus tipped over the tables. I wish I could have seen this. It says, and then he's in this place. And the blind and the lame come to him. And you know why they couldn't come before? The wall was too big. And Jesus tore it down so they could come. You know what he did to these people? He healed them. And you know what they became? The church. And you know what these people did who ended up becoming part of the church? There wasn't any big walls between them and others. Because they weren't the included, they were the excluded. And they were the basis of a movement that reached the world. Why? They weren't segregationists. They knew what it was like to be on the outside. I'm going to sing a song. We're going to continue to consult the blueprints when we think about the church. This morning we leave with this thought in mind. Priority one is to preserve the unity of the spirit. This strange thought. And if you do that, there's a good chance you'll make some religious people angry. Father, we've heard what you've laid out in your purposes for the church was that it would be inclusive. Again, it's not the Jews' problem, not their fault. They lived under a dispensation that suggested that discrimination is warranted, and that is what it read, but that is not your eternal plan. Your eternal plan was to tear down walls, and, and in order to do that, tear up laws, and that's what Jesus came to do, to remove the division that separates. So now there's just one group of people who come to you, and they are not defined as being racial, or they're not defined by gender, they're not defined by class, that they are those who believe, who understand that God reaches out to include 
a world of people. And as we believe that, we become your followers. And we indicate that by doing what we can to preserve unity. And unity with those who you would want to include. Them. So, I guess as we go on with this, teach us how to be the church. In Jesus' name, amen.